Well, we've been in this Lenten sermon series in which we've focused on these practices that bring us closer to God. And over the last few weeks, we've discussed our need for repentance, amen, our need for repentance, that turning away and getting back on track, our response in the face of temptation, am I the only one who experiences temptation in life or, you know, and uh, then the spiritual aspect of fasting and our need for silence in an ever-present noisy world. Uh, I want to say a special thank you to Reverend Robin Bell, our district superintendent, who gave the sermon this last weekend as I was still recovering from wedding. And even though she did a half-pike twist off her couch with a dismount on the floor the day before, and she uh, gave the sermon from a chair, I just want to say thank you, Reverend Bell, for, for doing this. I heard wonderful things about her sermon last week, and I heard she made you all practice that she had you sit in the sanctuary or in the multipurpose room for 60 whole seconds without saying a word. How hard was that, church? I, I experienced that. I mean, it's so hard to stay silent. It's so hard to... Oh, the, there, the mic made me go silent there a second. Uh, it's so hard to, to stay silent. It's so hard to, to block out the noise of the world. And today we're going to talk about something that all of us um, experience, but probably struggle with in some way, and that's prayer. Amen? We're going to talk about that practice of prayer. So as any good thing, we're not just going to talk about it, we're going to practice it. So let's begin with prayer today. Good and gracious God, wash over us your spirit. May we be met by you. Turn our hearts to you, our minds to you. Block out the noise and the distractions, O God. I pray, O God, that you would help me this morning, that you would be my words, your spirit would wash over me, that the meditations of my heart and words of my mouth might be acceptable in your sight. And I pray this in the name of Jesus and all of God's children agreed and said, Amen. Well, I don't know about you, but some of my earliest memories as a child were around prayer. How many of you as a child had to say the blessing at dinner? Or, yeah. And can anybody remember that prayer? God is good. God is great. Let us thank him for our food. Amen. Something like that. That was... You know, something, every family had a little bit different kind of uh, take on that. But, you know, I still do that with my grandchildren. I'll say, will you say the prayer? And, and you know, I'm so proud that they don't have a, a, a memorized prayer. They'll, they'll say something like, thank you, Jesus, or thank you for this food. And, and some of my adult children are just now beginning to offer those prayers in a way that, you know, they don't think their mom has to do it and, or their dad has to do it. I remember, though, vividly one time where I was just beginning to read. I was just beginning to learn how to read, and the family gathered around my grandmother's table, and they said, Terry Sue, would you pray for our meal? And what did they expect? They expected that God is good, God is great, right? Well, I, there was this napkin holder on the table right in front of me that my grandma had and there were napkins in it and it had a written prayer on the napkin holder. So I thought, huh, I'm going to get them today. And so I started reading this prayer off the napkin holder and every head popped up. Like, where did she get this prayer? You know, it's a great, it's a great time. You know, I love to do things like that to my family. So still do, by the way. <laughs> Another vivid memory I have around prayer is that when I would stay with my Aunt E, her name was Edith, Aunt E and my Uncle Bill, either for a week or a weekend, I loved to go stay with them. They didn't have children, so I was, they were like second mom and second dad to me. And um, I would go in at, in the ni- at night before bedtime, and I would get on my knees with my Uncle Bill and pray before bedtime. He would be in his room, on his knees, offering his prayers, and I would sneak in and get on my knees right beside him and pray. 
I remember my granny who sat behind an old coal stove, which was her only source of heat. And she would have the Bible in her lap and she would have her eyes closed in prayer and silence, either that or asleep, one of the two. But I knew that it was important. It was important. The foundation of prayer was given to me at a very young age. And I may not have understood exactly what was taking place in those prayers, but I knew from a very young age that I could call upon my Heavenly Father. I knew that God loved me, that I could call upon His name. Prayer. It's simple, yet it's very mysterious, isn't it? It's mysterious. In fact, Many theologians say that the more they understand about prayer or read and learn about prayer, the more mysterious it becomes. I believe it is N.T. Wright that says prayer is like putting on this big oversized shirt that we grow into, especially when it is moves from the personal prayer life to the worldly prayer life. I have numerous books on prayers. I've read numerous books on prayer over the years of my ministry. Authors such as N.T. Wright, Bruce Wilkinson, Ruth Haley Barton, Janet Holm Henry, Adam Hamilton, and Pete Grieg. Now, to, these are just to name a few. And if you walked in my office today, right down the hall, you would see that prayer lines the shelves of some of my bookshelves. Reading about prayer, though, is different than being in prayer. Amen. Knowing about prayer is different than praying that practice. Reading about prayer can provide knowledge and insight into different practices and beliefs and perspectives on prayer, but the act of praying itself is personal. It's a spiritual experience with a loving God who wants to hear your voice. We are created to be in relationship with God. And engaging in prayer involves connecting with God, expressing gratitude, seeking guidance, or simply being present in the sacred moment with God. It's an active engagement of the heart, mind, soul, and strength, rather than just a passive intellectual exercise in reading about prayer. Sometimes people tell me, Pastor, I don't know how to pray. Or, I'm going to leave that to the professionals. You know, too often people think of prayers as the words that pastors say on Sundays in front of a congregation or in front of a video camera. They say they don't like praying because they don't like public speaking. Well, trust me, it took a while to get used to that camera. During COVID, that camera and I didn't have a good relationship. (laughs) But That's not the kind of prayer we're talking about. Corporate prayer is so very important. But we're talking this morning about that private, personal practice of prayer. The conversations we have with God when no one else is listening. Those are the sorts of prayers Jesus prayed most often when he went away to a solitary place. To pray and be in conversation with his heavenly father. And I think sometimes we make prayer way more complicated than it has to be. Amen? We, we think it has to be, oh, just the right words, just the right setting. But no, prayer is simply talking to God. It's talking to God. Did you know, according to Pete Grieg, I loved his book that he, that he wrote on this. He says, one person in every four prays the Lord's Prayer each year on Easter Day alone. One person in every six bows before Mecca up to five times a day. Hasidic Jews stand at Jerusalem's wailing wall dressed in black and rocking to and fro in front of them between the giant stones of Herod's temple. Thousands of handwritten prayers are wedged in like badly rolled cigarettes, just stuffed in between those stones. It's worth pausing to acknowledge the unending chorus of human longing and need. Cries and chiming bells, mutterings in maternity wards, celestial oratories, and scribbled graffiti, graffiti, he says. In the words of Rabbi Abram Heschel, prayer is our humble answer to the inconceivable surprise of living. 
Prayer is our humble answer to the inconceivable surprise of living. I love that. Our English word prayer derives from the Latin word precarious. Precarious. We pray because life is precarious. We pray because life is marvelous. We pray because we find ourselves at a loss for anything but not the simple for the simplest words like please, thank you, wow, and help. In fact, that's what Anne Lamont entitled her book. Please, thank you, wow, and help. She titled it that because entitled that because that is when we turn to God the most. Please, God. Thank you, God. Oh, God, wow. And oh, God, help me. I know that on last Saturday, when uh, I witnessed my daughter, Holly Jo, and Andrew's marriage, I said thank you to God over and over and over again. The human emotion of thankfulness turns us toward our Heavenly Father just as the human need does when we experience fear and longing. We turn to God in those moments. And in our gospel reading today, Jesus tells us how to pray. He says, when you pray, not if you pray, when you pray, do this. But he not only told us how to pray, he gave us the example of a faithful prayer life during his reign and his time here on earth. Before launching his public ministry, he fasted and prayed for more than a month in the wilderness. Before choosing his 12 disciples, he prayed all night. When he heard the devastating news that his cousin John had been executed, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place, the scripture said. After feeding 5,000 people, He was understandably tired, but his response was to climb a mountain and pray. In fact, many times the scriptures tell us that he went to this solitary place. In fact, if you read through the Gospels, you will see that he goes to those solitary places either right before a miracle takes place or right after a miracle takes place. He is in conversation with God. And in the Garden of Gethsemane, before his arrest and crucifixion, he prayed so fervently that he sweat drops of blood. And on the cross, he prayed. He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Jesus prayed and prayed and prayed. I remember one time... um, I was teaching confirmation class. Confirmation class is uh, taking place right now with our students. They'll go right into confirmation class right after this worship experience. And uh, one of confirmation classes said, Pastor Terry, uh, if uh, Jesus was God, why did he pray to God? Anybody want to answer that one? (laughs) And I said, he gave us the example of how to talk to our Heavenly Father. right. He showed us what it was like to pray and to pray and to pray. And he gave us the example for this life in prayer, how it should guide us, how it should measure through our day and our life, but not just for ourselves, not just that personal, but also for the kingdom of God. Thy kingdom come, you finish it. Thy will be done. When Jesus gave us these words, we know them as the Lord's Prayer, he gave us the simple formula that has great impact, not on us just personally, but for the world, for the kingdom of God. Our Father, hallowed be thy name. We give God adoration right off the front. We call upon his his name, and and we say that he is holy, he is hallowed. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We pray for God's kingdom to reign here. How many times have we prayed that? God, when we see all that's happening in the world, thy kingdom come, God. 
Thy will be done on earth here as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. We ask God for our needs. We ask God to supply those, those needs for our lives. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. There's a two-letter word in there that is a really dangerous word. I've told you this before. As. As. We pray for forgiveness as we forgive others. Now, am I the only one in here who has trouble with that? How many times have I thought, oh, man, it is so hard for me to forgive them for that. The Lord's Prayer teaches us we pray for forgiveness as we forgive others. Ooh. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. We pray for guidance away from evil. We pray for deliverance away from temptation. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. We conclude with giving God all glory and thanks and praise because we know that we cannot do this on our own. Simple, yet powerful, and when prayed, life-changing. During the pandemic, they said, you know, uh, you need to wash your hands for a certain amount of time. You know, so, you know, I would wash my hands and I would say the Lord's Prayer as I was washing the, my hands to ensure that um, I had washed them long enough. But I was also calling upon my Heavenly Father. And yet, even in that, I would get distracted. Anybody get distracted in prayer? All the time, all the time. So some of the best advice ever given on prayer comes from Pete Gregan. He heard it from somebody else. It says, keep it simple, keep it real, keep it up. Keep it simple, keep it real, keep it up. Isn't that what Jesus is saying to the disciples? He says, don't put on a show when you pray. Go to your room. Your, your heavenly father knows what you ask before you even ask for it. He says, keep it from the heart. Now, when he is teaching his disciples this, he is addressing some of the practices, both of the Jews and the pagans at the time. At set times of prayer, devout Jews would stop what they were doing and pray. Some discreetly as Jesus is teaching, but others with pretentious display. Pagans or non-Jews at the time would repeat the names of their gods or babble the same word over and over without thinking. And he is telling us how to pray. Go into your room. Your heavenly father knows what you ask for. He knows what is on your heart before you even ask. Jesus clarifies that God cannot be manipulated by the performance of ritual prayers. The best prayers are straight from the heart. No set of words is the correct words. When I was younger, I'd think, I don't know how to talk to God. If I, what if I say something wrong? No. There's nothing that you cannot share with God. Nothing that you cannot say to God that God does not already know for he knows your heart. The best examples of this can be found in the Psalms. I love to read through the Psalms, especially when I'm feeling that need to, to, to pray. Hear these words from the psalmist who is begging for God's presence and comfort. Psalm 27. Lord, listen to my voice when I cry out. Have mercy on me and answer me. How many of you have ever wanted to do that? God, please hear me. Hear me when I cry. Answer me, O oh God. Come, my heart says, seek God's face. Lord, I do seek your face. Please don't hide it from me. Don't push your servant aside angrily. You have been my help. God who saves me, don't neglect me. Don't leave me all alone. Straight from the heart. And if we admit it to ourselves, we've all been here. We've all been where this psalmist was. I need you, God. Don't hide from me. 
Let me hear your voice. Let me seek you. You know, this last week we celebrated the life and resurrection of Jason Robeson, 48 years of age, a sudden heart attack, and and um, we celebrated his life with the family and friends who were here. And he, one of his favorite go-tos was the Psalms. And Psalm 91 was his favorite. He called it Psalms 911. And I think as you hear it, you're going to understand why he loved it so much and why he called it Psalm 911. Living in the most high shelter, camping in the almighty shade, I say to the Lord, you are my refuge, my stronghold. You are my God, the one I trust. God will save you from the hunter's trap and from the deadly sickness. God will protect you with his pinions. You'll find refuge under his wings. His faithfulness is a protective shield. Don't be afraid of terrors at night, arrows that fly in daylight, or sickness that prowls in the dark, destruction that ravages at noontime. Even if 1,000 people fall dead next to you, 10,000 right beside you, it won't happen to you. Just look, at, look with your eyes and you will see the wicked punished because you've made the Lord my refuge, the most high, your place of residence. Beautiful images. And it's from the heart of the psalmist. God, 911, I need your help. Save me from the pestilence and sickness. Save me from the enemy that throws arrows at me. Longtime member here, he was a World War II uh, vet. His name was Bob Apple. Bob used to come in each and every week to talk to me. Well, maybe not each and every week, but as, much, as often as he could to sit with me and talk with me about ministry and things like that. And, and he shared with me many stories. One of the stories that he shared with me was this was the prayer on his lips as he entered off the boat into combat into Italy. He prayed these words on that boat as he, before he went into battle. And these words were the words that he prayed when he didn't even know what to pray for, right? So scared. Such terror that he knew God would hold him close. So when we pray, Jesus says, let it be from the heart. Let your prayers be honest. As Peter Griggs says, the Bible is often more honest than the church. Amen. One of the Bible's greatest patriarchs, Jacob, wrestled with God in a night of prayer so violently that he was wounded and he never healed the rest of his life. He limped for the rest of his life from a night in prayer. Moses whined to God about the very people God had called him to lead. He said, why are you treating me this way, O oh God? What did I ever do to deserve this? Have you ever said something like that to God? God's big enough to take it. It's real. It's honest. It's straight from the heart. Pastor Marvin says God is big enough to walk in the woods and rail at God. In fact, that's what Jeremiah does. He rants at God. There's no other words for it. He said, you deceived me, Lord, and I was deceived. You overpowered me and prevailed. I'm ridiculed all day long. Everyone mocks me. So if those we look to in the Bible can be honest with God, can't we? Can't we be honest with God? C.S. Lewis said this, what seems our worst prayers may really be in God's eyes our best. God sometimes seems to speak to us most intimately when he catches us, as it were, off our guard. Amen. Keep it simple. Keep it real. Keep it up. Keep it up might be the toughest. As someone who struggles with all kinds of self-disciplines, routine physical fitness, walking away from the dessert table, daily study of scripture. I also struggle with maintaining those daily rhythms of prayer. 
My conversations with God tend to be all over the place. And and the scriptures say, pray without ceasing. There's nothing wrong with that. But the word is keep it up, right? If we pray only when we feel like it, we will survive, but we won't thrive. As Greg says, delight without discipline eventually dissipates. So keep it simple. Keep it real. Keep it up. We're going to practice. I'm going to give you a little bit of time this morning to just be in silence again and to pray. Keep it real. Keep it simple. Let's pray together. Lord, hear our prayer as we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.